we can now progress to tri-substituted benzene derivatives. So one of the first we might look at is this particular substitution pattern. So we have the 1, 2, 3 trifluorobenzene, and we're interested in the plant group assignment for this particular molecule. If I, you always try with benzene to see what rotations we have in the plane of the board, and I see that if I do a C6 or a C3 or a C2 even, this fluorine will go to a hydrogen, hydrogen, or a hydrogen, which tells us that we don't have a C6, a C3, or a C2 in that particular plane. The high order rotation axis we're going to find, if we spend some time looking for it, is one going along the dowel. So we have along this red axis here, I have a C2. And similarly to other molecules that we've looked at, there will be a mirror plane going perpendicular to the board that reflects this fluorine into that fluorine, for example. We also have a mirror plane in the plane of the board, so that tells us that we have the four symmetry elements, the identity, C2, and two sigma v's that we recognize that give us the point group C2v. So we see that many of the substitution patterns for benzene, at least the ones we've seen so far, tend to lead, in many cases, to the point group C2v. One thing I just might point out, just to show something which is of chemical significance, but doesn't change the mathematics, is that if I were to remove the fl this fluorine atom here, essentially turn it back to being a hydrogen, or replace it with any other atom, it will not matter, that, that we recognize this as being the meta disubstituted pattern, which also has the point group C2V. So whether I put the fluorine atom here or not, makes no effect at all on the point group assignment. It will change the chemistry, but it won't change the point group assignment. So let's look at two other examples of tri-substitution for benzene. So the next one to look at, uh, we'll try bromines this time. So yeah. So now we're going to substitute at the one, two, four positions so that we have the 1, 2, 4 tribromobenzene, and we want to see uh, point group assignments. If I look for a high order rotation axis perpendicular to the plane of the board, I will notice that I only have the identity. There's nothing beyond that. Let's try a trick that we used before for our multiple substitutions and see if there's a C2 that goes in the plane of the board somehow. Well, if I try it here, it would take bromine into bromine, but it would take bromine into hydrogen there, so that doesn't work. I could try it this way, and then take bromine into bromine, which is good, but it would take bromine into hydrogen, which isn't good. No matter how I would try to arrange such a C2, I would find out that there are no C2s. As it turns out in this particular case, for this tri-substitution pattern, that the only symmetry elements that we have are going to be the identity and a mirror. So by properly arranging the tri-substitution of our benzene, we've actually reduced the overall symmetry to that of the point group Cs. So it's important that the uh, point group symmetry changes as we go from one to three tri-substitution to one to four tri-substitution. And we have one more interesting combination, a tri-substitution for benzene. So let's take a look at that example. So here, let's substitute with chlorines at the one, three, and five positions. So here we have a one, three, five, trichlorobenzene. And we're interested in the point group assignment in this particular case. As we've been, has been our one to do with benzene is we first determine if there's a interesting high order rotation axis in the plane of the board. The rotations in the plane of the board, the axis is perpendicular to the plane of the board. And here we do see something interesting. We notice that if I rotate by 120 degrees, it takes chlorine to chlorine, 
chlorine to chlorine, chlorine to chlorine, hydrogen to hydrogen, and, and so on. So we actually do have a C3 high order rotation axis when we have the 135 trichloro substituted benzene. Do we have any other interesting rotational axes? Well, if I look for a rotational axis through the two carbons and the chlorine, so I have this particular axis, I also have a C2. And I notice that this particular C2 is perpendicular to my high order rotation axis, which is an immediate clue that I'm likely to have that. I know I definitely have to have a D3 group, and it's a strong evidence that there must be two more such C2s in the molecule. And I can find them pretty quickly. One is going to go through here. Uh, each one is going to go through one of the chlorine atoms. That's a, our hint. So we have a C2 there. And then last but not least, the last of the three C2s that's perpendicular to the C3 is right there. And since I have, make a note of it, we have three C2s perpendicular to a C3. This tells me right away that I must have a D3 group of some type. The element that we need to look for to definitively determine the point group assignment is a mirror. And we do notice that this particular compound is completely planar. Therefore, there is a mirror plane in the plane of the board. The mirror plane in the plane of the board is actually perpendicular. It is normal to the high order rotation axis, which is a, C, a C3 in this case. So that tells us that in this case of tri substitution, we have uh, the point group D3H. So we see that going from one, two, three, to one, two, four, to one, three, five trichlorobenzenes, in each case for the tri substitutions, we end up with a different point group assignment. Now we can investigate tetramethyl, uh, tetra substitution of our benzene ring. And I'm only going to show one particular example of this because uh, this will demonstrate some interesting principles. Let's look at this one particular tetra substitution. So here I have the one, two, four, five tetra iodobenzene. And I'm interested in determining the point group symmetry of this molecule. Now one thing, which once we start getting to uh, three and four and five substituents, it starts to get pretty complicated to see what's going on. But one thing which we can do, which will make our lives easier, is to realize what we haven't drawn. And what we haven't drawn are the hydrogen atoms. Okay, So the positions that are not substituted by iodine still have the original hydrogen atoms. And we could draw next to this a molecule that is chemically distinct, but has exactly the same point group symmetries. Because the important part about symmetry is not the particular identities of any particular substituent, but which ones are the same. And we notice here that one, two, four, and five are identical, and they're, they're atoms. And at the three and five position, three and six positions have no substituents. So let me draw another molecule here which will have exactly the same point group symmetry. And that would be this molecule. So all I've done is switch the hydrogen and the iodine positions. And if we have a benzene ring that has many substituents, this is often a useful way to simplify the situation. So I notice over here, I have what is a 1,4 diiodo, or the para di substitution. And even though these are two distinct compounds with different chemical properties, their point group symmetries are identical. And since we recognized that the one on the right, we already derived that as being D2H, then we know that the example on the left-hand side also has to be D2H for the one, two, four, five tetra iodo benzene. And we can use this trick uh, one more time, uh, do the following. 
Let's look at another Tetris substitution. And that would be this particular Tetris substitution. Let me add just one more iodine. While we're adding iodines onto it, let's add one more. So I see that in this case, we have the one, two, three, four, five, penta iodo benzene. So that looks really complicated when we have all those substituents. But I could just as easily swap the hydrogens and the iodines and put a single iodine in this position. And because we always number from the low position, this would be essentially the one position, we have a mono-substituted iodobenzene. And since iodobenzene, we've already determined to have the point group symmetry C2V, then I know that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 penta iodobenzene has to have, again, the point group symmetry C2V. That pretty much exhaustively handles all the examples of polysubstitution with a single substituent. So now let's look at the special cases where we have more than one substituent. So one of the examples we might use is if we disubstitute benzene. But in this case, we're going to have one substituent at the this position, and then we have another substituent Down here, so we have the one fluoro, uh, yeah, the one fluoro four iodo benzene. So we want to figure out what the point group symmetry of this particular molecule is. Now we notice it sort of bears a certain resemblance to the para di substitution, but we have to be careful. So um, if we look for the high order rotation axis that goes through, it's perpendicular to the plane of the board. If I try to do a C two as in the para di substituted uh, halogenated benzenes, that would take fluorine into iodine. And since those are not identical, we don't have a C2. And we notice that in the plane of the board, um, none of the rotations is greater than C1, the identity. So let's see if there are any other symmetry operations which we can discover for our molecule. Well, one of the ones that we notice is if we consider this to be the y-axis, that we have a C2 rotation, since it flips it over like a pancake, it flips our molecule over. So we might call this C2Y just to show the axis involved. So it does have a C2 rotation. It also has a number of mirror planes. One of the mirror planes, which I'll demonstrate with a ruler, goes along here to so reflect the left half of the molecule into the right half. There is also a mirror plane in the plane of the board. And we're getting pretty good at recognizing this particular point group. We have the identity, we have a C2 rotation, and we have two mirror planes that tells us that we have the point group C2V in this particular case. Now let's see if we could take this molecule and make a slight tweak to it and see how that affects the point group symmetry. So. For example, let's take our iodine and move it to the three position. The three position. So now I have a one fluoro three iodo benzene, and I want to figure out what the point group symmetry of this molecule is. Now notice that whereas in the previous molecule we had a C2 rotation along this axis, if I were to do that now, this iodine would flip over to here and, re and replace a hydrogen. So since iodide and hydrogen are obviously not identical, we no longer have that particular C2. We might try, as a quick check, remembering from our meta di substituted halogenated benzenes, that we might have a C2 along this particular line. But again, in that case, we we'll take fluorine into iodine. Those are two distinct halogens, so we don't have a C2 along there. And in fact, no matter how we arrange our molecule and look for uh, rotational axes, the high order rotation axis that we can find is simply C1, the identity. But we do have something. Now, in the previous molecule, we saw that we had a mirror plane that went along here, and that would, but that would reflect iodine into hydrogen, which are not identical. But we still have 
the mirror plane and the plane of the board. So we have E and we have a mirror plane. So that tells us that we have the point group CS. So we see that if we have two different halogens, the 1, 3 disubstituted benzene will have different symmetry than the 1, 4 disubstituted benzene. Let's take one more uh, example uh, to see something interesting that happens. And this is a, an unusual point group that we don't see very often in general, and we don't even often see that much in benzene. But this is kind of an interesting one. So let's look at the case where we have three hydroxyl groups. So this is a polyphenol that is known by the name of pyrogallol. Pyrogallol. So it's 1,3,5-trihydroxybenzene. So we want to see what the point group assignment would be for this particular compound. Now, one of the things that we know, and I've been careful to draw the uh, angles, uh, the carbon, oxygen, hydrogen angles in a particular sort of way. So that's drawn with intention here. So what we notice is, and we know that it has to be bent because of the sp3 hybridization of oxygen and the presence of the two lone pairs, which affects the bond angle. So we know that that has to be like that. So if we assume that, that both the oxygen and the hydrogen are in the same plane as the benzene ring, we can make our assignment. The first thing to look for is our high order rotation axis. We notice that if we go uh, in the plane of the board, that a 120 degree rotation, so a C3, would take this OH group to that OH group. Not only the oxygens line up and the carbons, but the hydrogens will line up if you have it drawn appropriately. And the same thing would happen for this hydroxyl group would go to this one, this one would go to that one. So we see that for this particular molecule with this particular conformation, that we do have a C3 axis. So one of the things we often like to do once we find something like that is to look for um, another C2 that might be perpendicular to the high order rotation axis. So one example might be along here, we might try that. What we would notice is that along this particular axis, we have a hydrogen on this side. If we rotate, it would bring the hydrogen to this side. And since there currently isn't a hydrogen there, that wouldn't make them look the same. So we don't have a C2. The uh, bent angle of the carbon oxygen hydrogen has destroyed what might have been a C2 along that, if we only had a halogen there. And we notice that the same is true at any of the hydroxy positions. So we don't have the C2s that we might expect might be perpendicular to the C3. So what does that tell us? It tells us right away that we do not have a D group. So we still have a C3 group of some type. And the big question is to find out what type of mirrors are present. We might look for vertical mirrors, since we like vertical mirrors a lot. Again, if I look for the vertical mirrors, we might expect them to be along an axis like this. But again, um, the oxygen would be along the mirror plane, but we have a hydrogen here, but not a hydrogen there. So the mirror plane would reflect it into nothing. And that tells us that we don't have a mirror plane. We don't have a mirror plane there, and we do not have a mirror plane here. So we have no vertical mirrors. But maybe we have a horizontal mirror. Where would that one be? Well, our high order rotation axis goes through the board. It's perpendicular to the board. And the mirror plane that we're looking for, if it were to be a horizontal mirror, would be the plane of the board. And it turns out we have exactly that type of a mirror. So we don't have a vertical mirror, but we do have a horizontal mirror. So this gives a somewhat unusual group, but a group that really does exist, called C3H. Our classic example uh, to keep in mind when we're looking for molecules that might uh, conform to the C3H point group, our classic molecule is uh, boric acid. And I can show right away uh, with a small modification of the molecule here of how we get that. So if we just replace the benzene ring with a boron atom, I'll draw the boron atom very big just to fill up the space here. This is exactly the structure of boric acid. So of inorganic compounds, the most common example of the C3H point group would be boric acid. In organic chemistry, the most 
common and kind of illustrative example of C3H symmetry would be pyrogallol, so long as the hydroxy groups are arranged in a particular sort of way. So long as the hydroxy groups are arranged in a particular sort of way.